impressive. That was very. Good morning, everyone. Please come and take a seat. Welcome to the 2019 Martha's Vineyard Book Festival. We are really, really glad that you are here. We've got a great uh, panel lined up for you today and all day. There are seven panels today and we alternate between the community center and here. Uh, and then tomorrow there'll be a wonderful series of author talks in the various tents. So I'm so excited to welcome you to this panel entitled Women Speak, Feminist Expression. Uh, before I introduce our moderator for what I know will be a great conversation, uh, a few, well, seven actually, uh, housekeeping items. One, the festival sessions today and tomorrow are free. That means donations and purchases are essential. Please buy the book festival swag. This is the really handsome denim tote. And you can also buy, thank you, Don, this great looking water bottle. So please uh, definitely buy those items. Um, if you're thinking you don't need any more totes or water bottles, just give us cash. A donation will be uh, appreciated. Large and small donations. It all adds up. Number two, food is available for sale. Please support our food vendors, Chef Dion, Mary's Lemonade, Orange Peel Bakery, Chef Amy Johnson, food truck, her food truck, Scottish Bakery. Lots of yummy items to eat and drink, and please remember to stay hydrated. We've got some water and cups over there. Um, um, three, the authors will take succinct questions from the audience after the discussion. Remember, please, no soliloquies in your questioning. <laughs> and when you are asking a question, if you line up either at this mic or that mic, and if you line up here, go that way. If you line up over there, go that way so you don't block the audience's view of our panel. All of the mics are on, um, but please be no further than a fist distance away from the mic or we won't be able to hear you. Four, immediately following this session, which will end at 11.55, our fabulous authors will be signing their books. The book signing tent is right over there and they'll sign for around 30 minutes. Please buy the books. Um, get your holiday shopping done in August. Wouldn't that be great? And uh, please um, don't try to engage our authors as they make their way over to the book signing tent. If you'd like to have a private moment with one of the authors, just buy their book. <laughs> and when they're inscribing it, you can have a, a little conversation at that time. Another advantage to book buying. Uh, five, a scheduling note. After this 11 a.m. session, the next session in this tent isn't until 1 p.m. It's the session entitled Memoir, Where We Came From, Who We Came to Be. The noon session on social justice will take place in the community center. Uh, six, today's seven panels um, will alternate. So if you want to see the very next panel after this one, you need to move over to the community center. Um, seven, um, well, seven is a repeat, and it's just that all, all of the book festival books are available in the book signing tent. You know, it's free to come to the festival, so please uh, buy lots of books. Uh, and without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator who will introduce our panelists and guide the discussion. Our moderator today is Dawn Davis. She is the vice president, publisher, and founder of 37 Inc., an imprint within the Atria Publishing Group of Simon & Schuster, which publishes, which publishes books from a diverse array of cultures and viewpoints. Uh, the books she has published include Nafisa Thompson Spire's book, Heads of the Colored People, which was featured in the Martha's Vineyard Author Series last year, and Tina Cassidy's, uh, who's here with us today, her book, Mr. President, um, How Long Must We Wait? And prior Prior to launching 37 Inc., Don was editorial director and then publisher of Armistead Imprint at HarperCollins. There, among other acclaimed books, she published the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Known World by Edward P. Jones. Uh, she, importantly for all of us here in this wonderful community of readers and authors, is a member of the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival Advisory Board. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panel and our moderator. Thank you. 
So this is a terrific panel, as I'm sure you've all gathered. And I want to just give a shout out to Sue Ellen, who somehow always manages to pull together this festival and bring best-selling authors, authors we've read and loved for years, uh, and new authors, debut authors. So I want to thank Sue Ellen. And then I want to get right into the heart of it. I want you all to talk about how you came up with the title of your book and what that says about your intention. What was your intention, and how did you come up with the title? I kind of know some of the stories, but why don't we just go down the line and we'll start with you. Emily Bernard is a professor of African American literature and other things uh, at the University of Vermont. She's a particularly graceful and beautiful writer as well. And your book mm -hmm. is so beautiful. Tell us how you came up with the title. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Don. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sue Ellen. And I'm so thrilled to be on this panel with these amazing authors and Don Davis. The, the title um, took some time, but it also felt really natural when I wrote the the essay, Black is the Body, felt to me that I was trying to work with the metaphor of the body a lot. And it, it suited me, it suited what I was interested in, thinking through race and gender and freedom. And how we can be free as people of color, as women, um, to literally move in the world through our persons. Um, I talk a lot with my students about what does it mean to be a woman and to be free. Um, literally, uh, not only on a larger kind of political sense, but in our everyday mobility. So it helped me, it helped focus me um, in terms of the questions I wanted to ask Black as the Body and my subtitle, Stories from My Grandmother's Time, My Mother's Time, and Mine, also kept me centered um, on the journey that I know I was on through the book and I wanted readers to accompany me on, which is how much of ourselves are we responsible for and are we truly authors of our own experience and how much of our experience is just simply the things we've inherited or chosen. Um, our ancestors' stories and our ancestors' ways of being, how much of those things do we carry inside of us and how many of those things um, can we shed? That, that makes sense. Uh, Tina Cassidy, you are a journalist and uh, work in communications. And you're, I know exactly how you got your title because we worked on this book together, just full disclosure. But Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait is about uh, Alice Paul and Woodrow Wilson and their tango for women's suffrage. How did you come up with the title, though? Yeah, so uh, it might be uh, best to just start with how the story came to be because the title, the original title, flowed from that. And the original title was not Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait? Um, in the summer of 2016, I was trying to avoid uh, election uh, coverage and, and enjoy my vacation, and instead I stumbled upon a trending hashtag on Twitter for Women's Equality Day, which was really interesting. It's coming up uh, later this month, and I didn't know what that was or what it celebrated, and it turns out it celebrates uh, the day that the 19th Amendment, which gave women the vote, was ratified in 1920. Um, and that led me on this journey to, to really understand that story, and, and what was shocking to me was how much that story was about today and the struggles, the issues, and everything that happened a century ago, we are all experiencing right now, too, issues of race and gender and, and politics and so forth, um, states' rights versus nationalism, um, or federalism, I should say. Um, so my working title for that book proposal was The Protester and the President. And Alice Paul, who's the leader of the movement for uh, the 19th Amendment, um, literally was one of the first protesters ever uh, to protest outside the White House. And she also organized the first women's march ever in America, and that was in 1913. And so for me, it was just a very clear David versus Goliath story, you know, a woman named Alice Paul, a quirky Quaker from New Jersey, going up against uh, the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Um, but as we talked about it, the title really evolved. There was, you know, we thought a lot about, are people going to think that this book is actually about today <laughs> instead of 100 years ago? Maybe that was a good thing. Uh, maybe it was a bad thing. Uh, we weren't so sure. But, you know, it sort of evolved over time to be something a little bit more poetic. Um, took me a while to get my head around that. We had lots of conversations about it. But I'm, I'm happy where we landed because because I think that it is, um, it is an actual phrase that was used during the women's movement then. I think it is a phrase that is still relevant today for so many questions that we face in America. And um, you know, hopefully people are intrigued by the question and search for answers in the book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Juliet? 
The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna. I love the title. Mm -hmm. It rolls off of the tongue. Um, tell us where that came from. So I, alone on this panel today, am a novelist. And it is, it, The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna is fiction. But um, the novel was inspired by my grandmother's life story. And she had a very strange, uh, weird life that I always, always wanted to write about my entire life. Um, and she did, in fact, have eight near-death experiences during her life. Uh, so when I was trying to come up with a tool for telling this crazy life story, I used those eight deaths as a framework. It became my table of contents and my jumping off point. Um, and it didn't take me a ton of inquiry into that backbone as I was starting to make notes to realize that the ways my grandmother almost died were consistently things that were dangerous to women in the 20th century. My, my grandmother was born in southern Italy um, in 1920, and she emigrated here in the 30s. And she had these eight deaths are kind of analogous to all of the things growing up in poverty without a doctor, um, trying to get an education, which was not meant to be for a woman from her class and, and village. Um, things like marriage and childbirth and family dynamics, which become very, very dangerous, especially in the kind of extreme patriarchy that she grew up in, and I was really pleased to see that this was both um, actually her true story that I could write about fictitiously, mm -hmm. highly fictitiously, and uh, but also an allegory to me of what the long 20th century was for women, and um, I could not be more pleased to be placed on a feminist panel right now, because that is not... Uh, I don't hold my cards close to my vest about why I wrote this book and the things I wanted to say. So thank you for having me. Beautiful. <laughs> Juliet is also a publisher, it should be said. So she uh, wrote this book while she was also helping other authors bring their books to fruition. Ruth Reichel, I know, needs no introduction for those of us who enjoy the bounteous foods of this island, who love uh, food criticism and food writing. You are, you know, the lodestar, so um, <laughs> <laughs> save me the plums. Talk to us about that. Well, you always have fantastic titles. And none of them ever started out as my title, as you may or may not know in this room. Um, authors don't only cho choose their titles. Uh, your editor weighs in, the salespeople weigh in, the marketing people weigh in. So when I started writing this book, I, re I was going to call it, right after Gourmet closed, my creative director looked at me and said, you know, Ruth, that was the last fun job. And I thought, there's the perfect title, um, <laughs> the last fun job. And I, it was important to me to have something like that because I thought most people thought that this was going to be a bitter book. And it's not. It's actually a celebration of a golden moment in publishing. And um, Condé Nast gave me this extraordinary opportunity. I mean, they basically handed me a magazine and said, make it as good as you possibly can. Um, spend lots of money, hire anyone you want. And it's hard to be bitter about that. I mean, <laughs> but so my editor, when I was finished, said, I don't think this title is good enough. And come up with something else. And I happened, at that point, to be reading the famous Wallace Stevens poem, This Is Just To Say, um, which is, uh, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Mm. Forgive me. <laughs> they were so sweet mm. and so cold. And um, then I saw that it was a meme on Twitter and people were paraphrasing it. And I thought, I should do something with plums. And then I started thinking about Wallace Stevens. And Wallace Stevens was not only very ahead of his time, a great imagist poem, poet, um, someone who was friendly with all those people who went to Paris, Hemingway, Fitzgerald. Um, he was also a physician who worked with poor people in New Jersey, and uh, someone with a real social conscience, and apparently a really great guy. And 
he embodied sort of everything I wanted gourmet to be. I wanted it to be ahead of its time, artistic, practical, have a social conscience, and I thought it's perfect. It's the perfect title, and of course, on top of that, it really was a plum job. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly was. Um, I want to talk to Lisa Tadeo. Your book, Three Women. Well, first of all, Lisa is a Pushcart Prize-winning journalist. She has written for magazines such as Esquire, McSweeney's, Granta, and then she, right out of the box, writes a New York Times bestseller called Three Women. How did you come up with that title? Um, well, Ruth half stole my answer. My editor came up with it, and I didn't fight it at all. <laughs> um, it started out, I talked to hundreds of women, hundreds of people in general, and there were about 20 to 25 people that made it into the first draft of the book, but we whittled it down to the final three women because they were the largest chunks, and when there were three women left, it just kind of made a lot of sense, and when he said it, I was like, that sounds good. That works. <laughs> it works. I wasn't actually, uh, this wasn't on my initial sheet of questions, but Ruth, you were just describing this job where you could hire anyone you wanted, you could, you know, remake the magazine, and yet you had to be talked into that job, right, in some ways, and they were going to, I think, pay you six times what you were earning before, and, you know, you got a car, you got all this access to New York City, a part that you may not have initially been comfortable. Do we women have to lean in more when these opportunities present? I think it's so natural for us to sometimes say, not me, I'm not ready. Uh, I, I do think, I mean, I had never heard of this syndrome before, but um, in talking to people about the book, I mean, it is clear that we as women um, are, we're very hesitant to take our power. And certainly, you know, when they offered me this job, I said, you know, I love that magazine. I think it's really important that there be a great food magazine at this moment in American history, and I'm glad you want to do it. I'm not the one. I don't know anything about management. Um, I can't do it. And I kept saying, they kept throwing, you know, the offer at me, and I kept saying, no, 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 um, I'm really not the one. Um, how can I tell 65 people what to do? Um, and um, I do think that it is really important for us, especially to bring our daughters up, to believe that um, they should take that leap. I mean, the, the, the lesson I learned in taking this job was that it is the things that you're afraid of that are most worth doing. And you probably shouldn't do anything you're not afraid of because it means you're not pushing yourself. Totally. Um, Lisa, you set out to write about women and desire. And what did you learn as you crisscrossed the country looking for the three women? You, you said you started and winnowed it down. What would you tell this room about the current state of women and desire? And how did you select the three that you, you ultimately selected? So, I mean, I don't know much about the state of women, and every, everyone's so much different, and the reason I chose these three women was not because they spoke about all women, but because they spoke very powerfully of themselves, and what I found, the... the can, can you tell the audience a little oh, bit about uh, the three women, or... So, um, the first one that I found, uh, my, her name was Lena, and I had moved to Indiana from New York City in quite a irrational, I mean, I, and ended up working, but <laughs> at the time I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I started a women's discussion group in the back room of a doctor's office, and a number of women came, and one of the women, one of the first women who walked in, her name was Lena, and she told the room that her husband had just told her she didn't want he didn't want to kiss her on the mouth and that the very sensation offended him and then they went to a couples therapist and the couples therapist said that's okay Lena the way that you feel about wet wool is the way that Ed feels about kissing you on the mouth and concurrently she was about to embark on a relation a she was about to meet her high school boyfriend with whom she had always been stratospherically obsessed at the river where they used to have their their intimate moments. 
Uh, the second woman, her name is Maggie. She is uh, she was a young woman in North Dakota who allegedly had an affair with her high school English teacher when she was underage. And he was later named North Dakota's Teacher of the Year. And uh, for a number of reasons, she came forward with the story. And the tri she, t she brought charges. And the trial went the way that one might expect, especially pre-Me Too. Um, and the third woman, Sloan, she, uh, I'd heard about her after moving into Newport, Rhode Island, and for actually several other people who were not her. And I, I heard a couple of rumors, but one was that there was some, you know, her husband watching her make love to other men in front of him. But the rumor that really kind of was shocking to me was that someone said that her husband wanted to have sex with her every day, and not only did she allow it, but she enjoyed it. And I was like, well, that sounds OK. <laughs> and the person who said, or told me was like, no, it's not. It's, it's disgusting. And, and the fact that that was, that was a reaction to, to what was a very healthy marriage, because it was aberrant, but it was also the happiest marriage that I came across of the hundreds of people I spoke to. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're gonna we're gonna shift topics a little bit <laughs> uh, because Juliet's novel is one of those old-fashioned yarns, multi-generational. It starts in Calabria, uh, and if, for anyone who enjoys the Ferrante novels, it kind of is it, it extends that story in a way, um, and it's really just a perfect beach read. But you, so she just talked about the happiest marriage she encountered, and. You're really talking about the patriarchy of uh, Italian culture, particularly from the South, particularly born of the just poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and you equate marriage, you have a chapter called marriage, and in parentheses I think it's rape. Yeah. So it's marriage rape, there's yes. um, drowning, immigration drowning. Mm -hmm. So I thought those were interesting yeah. kind of uh, yeah. juxtapositions. So. Well, there, so I, I had to do a ton of research for this book. I did grow up in an uh, Italian family um, with Calabres and, and Molizan uh, antecedents, but I went to this village where my grandmother was born to try to really get in the idea of, of what this culture was like. So it was so different 100 years ago, and it's still quite different now. And um, one of the themes of my fictional character Stella's life, um, and there are departures from my grandmother, so I don't you know want to offer any spoilers here, but uh, she never wants to get married. She has a very um, ab abusive father. She's seen how he treats her mother, and this is how she thinks of marriage. This is this act of slavery. And, and in the 19 teens and 20s, in a, a extreme Catholic patriarchy where women have no citizenship until 1946, they cannot own land, they cannot control money, um, they literally are the property of their husbands, as are their children. I mean, it, I see how if you have a man who's not a very, very good good person, good, happy, loving person, a marriage can become a very unhappy place where he enacts his power on his wife. Um, so that's Stella's defining factor. And you know, for her, the concept of marriage is enslavement. It is rape. And I thought it was so interesting when I was talking even to modern um, people living in this village, Yevoli, now that um, I, I interviewed a lot of older generation, septuagenarians, octogenarians, nonagenarians, um, who remembered what life was like before the war. And even to this day, there's a phrase that they use to describe having sex. Um, and it's doing the job. So men do the job, and women have the job done to them. So, so there's literally no discrepancy between, I mean, the man is always the actor, and the woman is always the acted upon. There's no room for female agency or desire in this concept. And some women who I know um, enjoy their sex lives would still talk about it, to, to, you know, actually to push on Lisa's point here, as if they were doing their husband a favor. Or they would brag about how they had cut their husbands off. And, and there's just, so I, uh, I thought, wow, if you did grow up in an abusive household in a situation like this, what, what, how fearsome would sex have been? And could that become a phobia for a young woman to really want to avoid? Um, and that was, uh, 
my so my book is very different from from Lisa's and it's um in its how it looks at sexuality, and yet this is something I think exists to this day. That's mm -hmm. so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I do want this to feel like a conversation, so if any of the panelists want to jump in, please please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to just, Tina, you have written about Alice Paul, this uh, fierce Quaker who goes up against the president. But when we think about, and I think this is true for most kind of uh, movements, you know, you think about the civil rights movement, and there's Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, but we all know that there were many more leaders and many more foot soldiers. When we think about the women's movement, we think about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony. We don't talk about the black women who were involved and what they were doing and all the foot soldiers. But we really, why isn't Alice Paul's name? Because after reading this book, what she went through, she was incarcerated for her beliefs. She was force fed uh, when she went on a hunger strike for her beliefs. Everything that we take, every time we cast a vote, we take for granted the work that was done. Is, was she too progressive for her time? Uh, so I just want to, before I answer your question, Don, I just want to say one thing in response to you, which is that um, Alice Paul never got married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, one of the first questions I get about my book is, was Alice Paul a lesbian? As if that is the most important, you know, yeah. thing to answer. Mm -hmm. um, Alice Paul is a monumental figure who without her leadership, we may not have had a 19th Amendment passed 100 years ago. And so it is it is the reason why I wrote this book, because I was never taught about who she was. I mean, there are great discrepancies in, uh, you know, history classes and, in, in, you know, starting at very early elementary levels. I think that is starting to change a little bit, and we are recognizing the gaps in who we choose as heroes and want to promote and so forth. I think everybody, you know, up until very recently thought Woodrow Wilson should be commended as a hero even though he segregated the civil service and did many horrible things as a president. He's now coming under new scrutiny um, as well. But I think the real reason why Alice Paul, um, she was not, I wouldn't say she was forgotten. I would not say that she, um, people did not, you know, know who she was. She was on the front page for eight years straight. Um, and she also wrote the Equal Rights Amendment um, two years after the 19th Amendment passed. And so the thing that's really amazing is that she was actively dismissed. People wanted her to be forgotten. Um, even the, the League of Women Voters, which is a, a you know a wonderful um, nonpartisan institution that we all sort of think of today as you know um, an important institution in registering women to vote, um, they grew out of the sort of opposition women's party, uh, women who were uh, sort of against Alice Paul's uh, more militant tactics. And they, they wanted to um, seize the legacy for themselves. Um, you you know, the, the, the nice girls, if you will, the women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who maybe we were early leaders and, and certainly deserve um, respect for what they went through, but they thought that, that Alice Paul should play by the rules, and she did not. And that is why we, you know, she was sort of buried in history. Mm. So interesting. <clears throat> I want to talk now a little bit about motherhood. It seems to me like um, it, it's the kind of ultimate feminine archetype if you were the mother, mm -hmm. Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think all of us have complicated relationships, or each, in each of your books, there's a complicated relationship to that. Mm -hmm. um, Ruth, I know for you as a working mom reviewing restaurants at night, your son Nick would be so happy when you could stay home and make spaghetti or, or entertain him uh, with his friends, make food for his friends. Um, of course, you talk about mothers in your book, and you were inspired by uh, your great-grandmother. Yeah. Um, Emily, you talk about, uh, you adopted, you have twin girls that you adopted from Ethiopia, and you write beautifully about how you are, uh, were made to feel in some ways uh, other because you didn't have them biologically. And are we still kind of yoking motherhood mm -hmm. as the ultimate expression of feminist mm -hmm. the culture? But it's organic, biological, so yes, destiny. I, before, I just was in this dream state as you guys were talking and I was thinking about um, ancestry mm -hmm. and these generational uh, issues when it comes to being a woman and what we teach our, the next generation coming up. And for me, my grandmother was such an important uh, figure hovering over me, my great-grandmother, uh, making their way as women Mm -hmm. as strong and thoughtful and powerful women in a in the Jim Crow South mm -hmm. 
um, where they were not recognized as human beings, mm -hmm. and battling with men, yeah. and having to establish, carve their place out in and against the family. And it was something I really wanted to honor. Mm -hmm. um, there's a line that always breaks my heart in the book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, mm -hmm. by uh, Zora Neale Hurston. And the main character has that grandmother who, who's out of fear of her entering into sexual curiosity, slaps her across the face and said, I wanted to pe preach a great sermon about a colored woman sitting on high, but there was no pulpit for me. And it's just, I, I think about our grandmothers, great grandmothers, and all the things they could have done and wanted to do. And that was something I wanted to honor and mm -hmm. remember in my book. Yeah. But right in motherhood, and those desires. Um, there's a writer, Louisa Zaldo, who recently passed away, and she has a, a moment in her, one of her books, her son coming home, and her son coming home from school and saying, her mother's working, Louisa's working, and the son says, you know, moms all over the world are making chocolate chip cookies for their kids right now, <laughs> and Louisa's decision to just keep working. And I needed those models as I was tr trying to summon the courage to lean in and do the things I wanted to do and I was afraid of. I needed to read those, those hard choices that, that aren't, aren't often applauded that we make as women and as mothers. Um, my daughters did not emerge from my body but they are very much part of me. And I learned so much about being a mother and being uh, a human being through adoption. I think I was someone who really honestly believed in biology mm -hmm. before I adopted. That was a lesson I had to learn. And that was the gift adoption gave me. Um, understanding that my job is to shepherd these young people until they're ready to, to fly on their own. Um, but it's a, co it's a contest, you know, always. It's the, the working as writers and, and being a parent, it's, there's no kind of symmetry, but it's something that I find really inspiring in terms of the writing and the anxiety that produces sometimes the alienation. You need to address it in the work. So it's central to how I think of myself. Actually, as, a, as, a, as an independent woman, I also need, I think, the, the bonds of motherhood to remind me, um, to, remind me what, to maintain my own sense of freedom and individuality. Does anyone else want to speak to that question? Um, I wanted to pick up on the thread about, you know, what we teach our children and what, how we encourage those around us to, you know, be their true selves. Uh, you know, Alice Paul's uh, childhood growing up as a Quaker was essential to the leader she became because she, her parents taught her that everybody was equal. It didn't matter what your race or gender was. And I think that she really and truly was indoctrinated with that viewpoint early on. Um, and she probably couldn't have uh, sort of stayed with it if it wasn't really religious for her. Mm. Um, and so, you know, to think about what would happen if we all really worked at teaching our kids that and spent an hour every Sunday almost in silent meditation around that idea, I think we'd be a very different country right now. I, I think one of the themes about motherhood that's so, uh, is breaking the chain of trauma and uh, looking back at our mothers and what we blame them for. And, and I, one of my sources of inspiration um, in wanting to write this book was my, my grandmother who I mentioned was so, uh, her last time that she almost died, she, she had a cerebral trauma and ended up having a lobotomy. And, um, and so the last 30 years of her life were lived in this kind of shell, um, childlike existence where she was always either very joyful or angry and she needed full-time care and her children who loved her and revered her because we're Italians and we're very stereotypical about certain things but uh, at the same time their memory of who their grandmother of the, who their mother my grandmother had been before um, this accident had it became eroded and um, and so by the time this accident happened when I was five so I was old enough to kind of remember her a little bit and also be horrified to watch uh, how the memory drifted away and this woman who survived so much and uh, sacrificed so much to keep her family together was now being remembered as this child who liked to wear giant red hats and distribute sticks of deodorant to strangers as a present I, I mean it was I I thought that 
the greatest gift I could give to her would be to try to restore her legacy by writing about who she had been as an integer before that was medically taken away from her. And um, and revisiting the the legacies of our misunderstood grandmothers has now kind of become my, my flag. And and um, the best part about writing this book is having other people tell me about their grandfather and grandmothers. So if anyone wants to do that, I welcome you now. But I did think reading all of the books of the other panelists, I saw so much about um, both that, that chain of what we learned from our mothers, the good and the bad, that defined us all as writers and what brought us to the topics at hand, um, and in addition to what we're giving our children. So I think this is a really, I hope other people speak up about this too. So. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I talk about me being a mother in Save Me the Plums, yeah. but I've actually written a book about my mother because I felt I owed it to her, mm -hmm. which came out of a speech that I gave where I said, I wake up every morning grateful that I'm not my mother. <laughs> and the whole audience went, <gasps> and then I went on to talk about my mother. My mother was born in 1908, so she was the first generation that actually had the vote. And she and so many of her friends were educated. Uh, my mother had a PhD. Um, uh, basically not permitted to work because that's it was embarrassing to your husband, etc. And they were smart, angry, and frustrated. And um, I am really grateful that my mother basically brought me up saying, don't be like me, mm -hmm. get a job, know how important working is. Mm -hmm. And um, and I feel like, you know, all of us of my generation, I mean, we stand on the shoulders of these women. Mm -hmm. And after I gave this speech, I, I went into the bathroom and all these women came in weeping and telling me the stories of their mothers who were just like me, who um, were not allowed to work. And, um, you know, I think we now are sort of, we're in this age of crazy, perfect parenthood where women are supposed to sacrifice themselves for their children and I'm so grateful that the message I got was don't do this mm -hmm. and you know what I knew was that I would be a really horrible mother if I had to stay home mm -hmm. every minute I mean that I um, balancing work and childhood is really hard and every young editor who came to me and said I'm pregnant and I would say are you going to come back to work afterwards and I always said yes and I said and now you will understand guilt you <laughs> thought you knew what guilt was but you don't because if you're a working mom no matter where you are you feel like you're doing the wrong thing absolutely Lisa in your research even if the women didn't make it into the final cut did you find that um, motherhood kind of affected the way they moved around in the world or their desire in many ways anyways yeah, I mean, uh, completely. And it's funny because everybody always talks about daddy issues and nobody really talks about mommy issues and, like, I have major mommy <laughs> issues. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so for I, I noticed that across every woman I spoke to, more so than with the men, that the weight of the mother, specifically the weight, not specifically, but because I was writing a book about desire, specifically the weight of the mother's desire and how whether the woman knew very little or too much or the perfect amount, it was still, it still affected the way that the young woman or the woman, the women that I spoke to moved around in that way. And when it came, I wrote about my mother in the prologue mm -hmm. because I, I began to recall these things that she had said to me that I had not really followed up on and she had passed away so I couldn't ask her. And I began the book with this man who would masturbate while following her on the way to work. And she had told me that in passing when I was in my early 20s. And I didn't really, I was like, oh, ha, ha because she was like, oh, ha, ha. And, but then when I looked at it and I asked my older brother about it, it was to, to, to try to understand the way that that would have made her feel in the moment and how that was sort of, that legacy might have been passed down to me. Not only, and not that she taught me to let men masturbate behind me, but, Thank but, God. 
Um, but the the notion of of uh, the notion of a woman letting that happen and not saying anything. It was Italy in the 1960s, so you know it's a little bit more lax. Um, but the the notion that she allowed that, I think, is passed down in some way, mm. and that that really got me thinking about it. That's interesting. We were talking backstage about how are we going to tie these disparate books together because they're all so different. But your mother grew up in Italy. <laughs> you obviously talk about Italy. And your husband is Italian-American. And there's right. this great scene where you know your family's going to accept him, your southern black family, because he, the first thing he wants to do when he meets them is you know, devour their food. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, they're like, he's good. He's one of us. <laughs> um, Ruth, your book is obviously about your uh, transition from New York Times restaurant critic to editor-in-chief of Gourmet. But I also read, and, and you know, for those of us who are foodies, and I'm one of them, I, you know, devoured it on that level, but I also read it as a book about leadership. Mm -hmm. There's this fantastic scene where you're still at the Times, but you go in to meet your new staff, and uh, one of the chefs has made a chocolate cake, and uh, Everyone is criticizing it. They're being quite critical. It doesn't have this, it lacks this, it lacks that. And you can, I, I felt the chef just getting demoralized by every comment. And you taste it, praise it, you know, identify exactly what she's done right. And then you gently suggest things that she can do that might make it better. And I felt like you were a compassionate leader. Do you think women lead differently? Absolutely. I, I think women lead totally differently. And um, I, I mean, I was lucky because I really, I never took a management course. I had no idea how to lead, but I had had two great women bosses and I thought, I'm just going to think about how they did things. And um, I, you know, look, I come, I, I lived in a commune in Berkeley for <laughs> 10 years. Um, I, I really believe in the group. And, you know, the first thing I said to the staff was, this isn't my magazine, it's our magazine. And what do you think we should do? And. Um, I think unlike almost every other editor at Condé Nast, I didn't love every article we published. Um, and you know, there's these stories about, you know, Graydon Carter going through at the last minute and pulling things out because they're not good enough. But I thought it was more important for my editors to f have ownership of the magazine. So, you know, if some editor would make an impassioned case for a piece that I didn't think was the greatest idea, we would run it because I didn't feel it was mine and I don't think that men do that. And what I thought that I had to do as a leader was find out what people were good at, not have a job that they had to fit into, but since I inherited this big staff and my boss said, you know, maybe you'll have to clean house and bring in your own people, and I thought, what people? I don't, <laughs> I don't have my own people. And secondly, I mean, I just can't imagine going in and saying, okay, you're all fired. And you know, what I have to figure out is, what are these people good at? And you know, it, there is the greatest joy in taking an unhappy shop and watching people get agency and you know do the, what they're good at and. Um, it's so exciting to watch that kind of creative energy happen. But I think it very much is not what men do. Yeah, you write, nothing feels as good as building a team and empowering people, watching them grow and thrive. I, I definitely picked up on that. I know that there are lots of questions um, out in the audience. I'm going to just ask a couple more questions. So if you think you have some, start thinking about them. And we have the two mics. But um, I guess. Uh, Tina, I want to ask you about Alice Paul's leadership style. She she left the main women's party and formed her own. How do you think she managed? 
Uh, well, first I would say that um, any woman leading a century ago was a radical thing. So it was highly scrutinized and uh, there was a lot of interest. Um, and in fact, um, the tactics that those women were employing at the time, um, you know, appealed to Gandhi. He was watching very closely in the audience at rallies and so forth uh, and inspired the civil rights movement. The thing that they, that Alice Paul was incredibly good at um, was organizing at the grassroots level. And you can say that is a typically female thing. Um, you know, women are organizing around the kitchen table at church in the bathroom in case anyone's wondering what all the women are doing in the bathroom. That's what's happening. Um, but, in, you know, she really knew how to work it and how to build a network. And, you know, there's that sort of evolutionary biology idea that women, um, uh, uh, they tend and befriend, right? So they grow the garden and they befriend the people around them. And, and if they need them in a crisis, you've got your people there. Um, the, I think that is innately female. But there are three other things that I don't think you can um, say are female qualities per se, but something that Alice Paul did that made her very successful. One, um, she, uh, she led by example. She didn't just inspire women to go get arrested and go on hunger strikes. She did that herself first many times. Uh, she pulled all-nighters. She worked relentlessly, and that is what inspired other people to do the same. I think the other thing was that she really focused on what she wanted the outcome to be. She wasn't just organizing with no um, goal in mind. It was a very simple concept. Women should be allowed to vote. And so we needed a federal amendment because the states wouldn't grant it to, to women, especially in the South. So having clarity of purpose purpose is essential, right? And then the third thing is just uh, creativity. She just constantly thought of new ways to build the movement um, and to bring, rally people to the cause. And uh, that cr constant creativity, constantly trying new things and changing, you know, it wasn't about her ego. It was about what was going to work. So I think that those are qualities that any leader today can mm -hmm. pull from. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to questions. I know these authors are so dazzling. And I will say while you're lining up, the books are fantastic. I had two weeks to read. I'd read two of them. I had two weeks to read the other three, and I flew through them. They are great proverbial beach reads, so I do hope you get a chance to support the authors. Um, women, politics, and leadership. Rightfully or wrongfully, how does Hillary's shadow affect the prospect for a woman to emerge from this year's Democratic prim primary process? <laughs> Everyone's looking at me. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the fact that there are five women running says a lot. That in and of itself is progress that we should recognize. I think if you look at how many women were elected to Congress in the midterms, that should be recognized as progress. Um, I think it is inevitable that we will have a female president um, very soon, whether it's if it's in the next election or not. There's probably also a chance that there could be a vice presidential nominee who's a, a woman. Um, so I'm, I'm super hopeful. I think, um, you know, the fact that women are taking over school boards and, and governorships and mayorships and so forth, like it's really happening. Um, so I, I'm feeling hopeful. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Hi, um, this is for Juliet. Um, I just finished your amazing book. Um, and in it, there were obviously you were dealing with a lot of female rel relationships, mm -hmm. familial and, and that sort of thing. And I was always under the naive, I guess, um, conception that women had, they may have duties, they may have, you know, to respect certain norms within their culture or within their family but that there was always a common understanding and whatever, you know, bond beneath them. And one particularly um, amazingly dramatic part of your book that kind of wasn't so. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if on a larger scale, have we moved to the point where, you know, we women can on some level bond together or are we still as different now? Than that is such a great question. I, I think that um, I'm looking at a very poor part of the world in the beginning of the book and then the very, very difficult scenario of immigration, which in the 1930s, can I just say, was much, much easier than it is now. There is no legal path to citizenship for people like my grandparents. So, I mean, in the hardship 
type of these situations, I have found um, a lot of people who might be good in other scenarios, it really brings out the worst in you. And um, it, it creates, when you have no power over anything else around you, you can lash out at the people who are closest who you might have power over. But um, yeah, I thought one of the most fascinating parts about writing about Italy in the first half of the 20th century, especially southern Italy, is this is a land empty of men. Um, they have been either lost to war, the first and second world wars took huge percentages of villages away, and then to emigration, because there was no other way of making a living in this really aborted economy. Um, so you have every possible power dynamic playing out among the women who are left who are holding things together. And it was really a privilege to me to be able to tell some of those more complex female stories in that, that part of Italy. So thank you for asking. Um, I'll have a question for Emily, if, if no one else has a question. You're the one, you have these two, how old are your daughters? Thirteen. Thirteen. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have two teenage daughters. What message do you give to them? What, what hope do you leave them? I have a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, and they view the world so differently. They view relationships differently. They view gender differently. Um, what, what word of advice, what hope? do you give them? Well, I think I get more, you know, of an education and hope from them, you know. I think I'm, I am, have inherited so many, you know, things we can't control about. And they come out, you know, when you're, as you get older maybe, and dealing with young people, all of the vestiges, the internalized sexism, I have to battle and see and with embarrassment, you know, as I'm trying to parent them. But I'm also lucky to have young people in my life because I teach. And I was teaching a class on African American women writers right when Me Too was first dropped. Mm -hmm. And these kids were just having these amazing revelations, and they were subtle at this, you know, at the Thanksgiving table, they could tell Great Uncle Frank, and you can't talk to me that way, right. and you can't make fun of me anymore. And they would come back to class, and we would snap together. And then I would, I found the courage to make changes in my own life. I mean, that was just, it, I still am amazed at the ways in which I was complicit in participating in certain kinds of sexist practices. You know, I learned from them what the Whispering Network is. Definitely. I had to look at myself. So I feel that I am evolving as they are shaping and changing the world, and so, I'm really so what, grateful. So what have you changed? What have I changed? Yeah. Well, I tell on people now. <laughs> and I also tell off Great Uncle Frank <laughs> and the men around me um, who I love and I've tolerated it and quietly grumbled. I'm, I think I'm better. I'm better for my students. I to protect them better now because I understand I have a different appreciation of the language of what to call things. Mm -hmm. So it's incremental, but it's also my vision has changed. Like just I think any, all of us right now, you know, who are learning a lot from me too. The again, the small revelations about the kinds of things you put up with. Um, you don't have to, you know. I, I'm. Those are the small things, the changes I'm making. No, I was thinking. There's no way post Me Too that a woman in your mother's position would let a guy just masturbate daily as he <laughs> follows her to and from work. I mean, yeah, it's absurd. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless he was paying her. <laughs> just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have one more question. <laughs> Good morning. I just wanted to ask, based on Lisa's book, Women and Sexuality, you don't often hear about that in books and texts, and moving forward, how do you all feel about writing about sexuality as a female in today's mm -hmm. world? Me? Um, it, it's, it's hard. It was hard because I did a lot of, most like 90% of the research and the writing pre Me Too. So while I felt the same way pre Me Too as post Me Too, like Emily was saying, there was a big difference in what you allow only because you see, it's just a different, you're just living in a different time. The thing that was really interesting to me was that I, uh, with Maggie's trial, Mar Maggie was in Fargo, North Dakota. I don't know that it would have gone much differently had at post Me Too, and actually I'm pretty sure of that because I spoke to people off the record who were near the jury and investigators on the case, and they all pretty much agreed that it probably wouldn't have gone any differently. So while a million things have changed in a positive way, a lot of things don't change in certain places in different pockets of the country that are not the coasts or the big cities. So I think writing about desire today is 
I think it's a lot easier. But to that end, I think that while we are talking about what we don't want, I think we're not quite talking about what we do want. Interesting. And the, because there's a lot of judgment that comes from that, there's no more judgment from saying what we don't want. But if we do want something that's not quite okay, then people shame us still. I, th I think one, one of the things that for, I think there's a real age distinction. Um, and I think it's not just me too. Um, I think ever since the internet, kids have been brought up with vast amounts of pornography. Um, which has changed their idea of sexuality in ways that I honestly don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my son, who's 30, said, you know, that, you know, starting at a very young age, he and all of his friends, male and female, were all just bathed in pornography. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I, I mean, so <laughs> I, I feel very confused about it and I read you know contemporary novels about desire and sexuality and it's a world I don't get well we're going to end on pornography, <laughs> <laughs> which you're not going to download. But thank you all so much Lisa, Ruth, Juliet, Tina, Emily, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all so much. And now our volunteers will escort our authors over to the book signing tent. Be sure to buy your books at the book sales tent and get them inscribed. And uh, the next session in this tent will be at 1 o'clock. The noon session is in the community center. Thank you.